thousands of cases of cardiac surgery in the early years before it was recognized you could do so without transfusion. There are so many things about Dr. Cooley that you know warrant your respect. It's it's almost impossible to name them all. I mean, he's sort of the consummate surgeon. I mean, he, he was uh, fearless as a as a technical surgeon. Now, this is the heart which we used uh, in uh, Mr. Carp uh, to replace his own heart. He would tackle anything in a time when a lot of what he was doing was unknown. He basically uh, pushed the field of cardiovascular surgery into the forefront. And he, along the way, developed certain areas of interest and expertise that, that he then passed on to his students, of whom I was one. Um, certainly, he was one of the very first uh, heart surgeons that agreed to operate in a bloodless manner. I think the last time I talked to him about it, he had, and his team had done 20 or 30 heart transplants without the use of any blood. Dr. Cooley helped to establish a set of guidelines for cardiac surgery in the mid-1970s. If we had adopted his guidelines back in the mid-70s before HIV became extremely rampant, we might have averted a lot of HIV infected patients and deaths because many of our HIV patients were secondary to blood transfusions, among other causes. Практику я свою начал в 1974 году, после окончания института, начал работать в Сибири, в регионе Кузбасса, где очень много было и есть шахт. И вот я помню, что был очень интересный случай, когда одного шахтера завалило во время взрыва в шахтах, у него полностью ноги были завалены. И туда, туда спустился мой ученик, Руслан его звать. И вот на месте он произвел уникальную операцию. То есть невозможно было достать шахтера, он произвел ампутацию одной ноги, одновременно обезболил этого шахтера, одновременно ввел кристаллоиды внутривенно. А надо все это понимать, что это в условиях шахты, где пожар, где все падает. У него одна лампочка на лбу только, которая освещает. И вот, тем не менее, этого шахтера 4 часа длилась эта операция. Потом почти 6 часов его доставляли на поверхность в клинику. То есть прошло время 10 часов. И этот шахтер потерял ну, более 75% объема циркулирующей крови. То есть критически. И тем не менее, он 10 часов прожил, этот шахтер. Его лечили, и через месяц он, правда, на одной ноге, но тем не менее, он здоровым ушел домой. Уникальный случай. И за этот случай вот этого врача Руслана правительство наградило орденом. Вот в том числе и из этого случая я тогда сделал вывод и начал задумываться о том, что А зачем переливать кровь? Если человек прожил без переливания крови определенный промежуток времени, много часов, то какой смысл ему в дальнейшем переливать крови? Я не вижу этого смысла. И с тех пор, наверное, я начал этими проблемами заниматься в научном аспекте. Medicine, I thought, would be the opportunity of a lifetime for me to be able to help people. I recognized at some point in my career that I didn't understand what uh, blood components do, uh, nor did I understand when to appropriately use blood components. I also recognized that my colleagues 
were in the same place, but for some reason we're accepting that as, uh, as a practice. I'm a clinician who is not only an advocate, but a spokesman for my patients. This case may have been one where the enormity of lessons were unprecedented in many ways. It was a relatively young individual who had a gastrointestinal bleed in another hospital. The patient ended up with a significant low hemoglobin of around two grams. And uh, we had already started our bloodless program and his wife was looking high and low for a place that would take care of him because the physicians in that particular institution had absolutely no knowledge, nor do they have the capability they felt to care for him and essentially were hoping for the best, which as you know is not a plan. The big lesson for us was that we were searching what to do for somebody who had a hemoglobin of 1.7, which in my training was incompatible with life. I understand you got a phone call from the hospital that transferred him? Yeah, they wanted to know when he actually passed away. They were shocked to find out that he actually survived. Before 1900, doctors had not understood why some transfusions were successful, while others caused bad reactions and even death. But in 1901, Landsteiner, a young scientist in Vienna, thought there might be different kinds of human blood, which might account for blood not always mixing properly when transfused from one person to another. Landsteiner received the Nobel Prize in the early 1930s for a very simple discovery. And that simple discovery was that on the surface of every red blood cell, there's a group of molecules that distinguish it as having a specific blood type. Prior to his discoveries, whenever somebody would give a transfusion, there was a significant chance, and it was really about 40, 50% chance that you would get the wrong blood type and that that could conceivably kill you. There are four different types of blood, A, B, AB, and O. Patient in room 216 needs a transfusion right away. I'll give it to him. I'm his brother. Stanley, he's dead. Yes, but he wouldn't be if we'd been more scientific about it. Brother or no brother, what he needs is type A. And the right blood donor for him could belong to any race, since the four blood types appear in all races. Today we know there are probably hundreds of blood types. Some of them are considered major, and some of them are considered minor blood groups. But be that as it may, there's an identification system and nature is telling us something. Nature is telling us that my blood is specific and so is yours. And you've evolved from all the other people before you to have that specific blood. Blood has a number of different cells that circulate within it. There are red blood cells that carry oxygen. There are platelets that intervene and create coagulation and clotting when it's necessary. Our blood circulates through hundreds of miles of capillaries, arteries, veins. It goes from a major central canal, the aorta, much like the main canal in Venice down to smaller side streets, arterioles, eventually to the little tiny neighborhood canals. 
When you get down to these localized little flowing areas of the bloodstream, that's where the real action occurs in terms of transfer of oxygen. The beauty of the circulatory system is to take the oxygen that we breathe in from the external atmosphere and get it out to our farthest little pinky or toe and get it delivered when it's needed. Max Perutz, right, who won a Nobel Prize for his incredible insights into hemoglobin. Even he went to the grave fighting views on hemoglobin, and his views were by no means accepted. Uh, that's perhaps not so well known. Those in the know know that there are aspects of the story that remain to be understood, and those aspects couldn't be fully understood within the simple frameworks that most of us can regurgitate. So hemoglobin has been a battleground of science for many, many a year. The uh, oxygen in the air we breathe uh, is exposed to the red cells in our lungs. Yes. And let the red cells carry the oxygen to the tissues because the red cells contain hemoglobin. Now let's look at that hemoglobin for just a moment. That is a word made up of two parts, hemo <coughs> and globin. And the hemo means blood. And the globin comes from the word globulin, which means the protein materials in the blood. There are discoveries, right, that lead one to understand that red cells are important for oxygen delivery. And that was a very early discovery because people could see red blood cells. And they investigated that and found that hemoglobin was the player important in the delivery of gases. It would release oxygen. It would release carbon dioxide. It was a, really a simple extrapolation then that giving back red blood cells would make people better. There's something really missing in this biology. The simplicity of just taking liquid from one individual and entering into another clearly is, is not simple at all. One of the great fallacies that's occurred in medicine all around this religion of blood transfusion is that by giving a unit of red blood cells, one improves oxygen delivery to the tissues. When we transfuse a unit of red blood cells, the tissue delivery of oxygen to critical organs actually drops. It becomes worse rather than better. Max Bruce did say that science is truth, and um, he, he has had an, an enormous impact on the way I think. I think all the time that there is no chance that I can trick nature here. We like to say that the respiratory cycle is really a three gas system. The Handbook of Respiratory Physiology, the classic text, will include our model of a three gas respiratory cycle, so we missed a gas. Um, Hemoglobin doesn't just ferry oxygen from lungs to tissues and CO2 back, carbon dioxide back to the lungs, but it carries this third gas, nitric oxide, in a protected form, um, and it releases the nitric oxide together with oxygen. The nitric oxide then dilates the blood vessels so that the oxygen can get to the tissues. Um, what turns out is that our blood banks are deficient in nitric oxide. When you store blood in the blood bank, the red cells lose their nitric oxide, and they are therefore unable to dilate blood vessels, and oxygen delivery to tissues is thereby impaired. So the world's blood supply is deficient in nitric oxide, and those red cells do not seem able to deliver oxygen in the same way as a fresh red blood cell is capable of. When you cut your finger, you start bleeding. That blood, if you just let it drip, will at some point coagulate. Understanding the coagulation system is, is a mystery. How does the coagulation system know 
only to clot at the point of injury and not clot throughout. Not only do we not understand the intricacies of this system, but in fact, we're just now starting to understand that the coagulation cascade and looking at very simplistic diagrams of how the coagulation system is activated through which every physician and nurse has to learn by art, it probably doesn't exist in nature. And we know probably just the tip of the iceberg. Я люблю, когда есть свободное время, смотреть познавательные передачи по телевидению, и в том числе BBC есть замечательная передача о животных. Вот в одной из передач я увидел, что происходит с волком, которого там при драке ранили другие волки, и у него кровопотеря. Значит, он ложится, зализывает рану, то есть останавливает кровотечение. Второе, он ползет к ручью, чтобы напиться воды, это значит, что такое? Восстановить объем циркулирующей крови. И третье, он ползет в тихую нору, где отлеживается, то есть создает себе покой. Вот три основных момента. И я понял, что мы, врачи, должны тоже следовать у пациентов этим трем моментам основным. When we store blood in the blood bank, it's not like storing a fine red wine that you want it to become more complex. Why does blood stored in blood banks seem to be associated with so many adverse outcomes, including heart attacks, organ failure, and death? If one stores red blood cells, other bad things happen. They actually change their shape. They become more rigid. The blood bag is filled with acid and ions like potassium, which cause injury. You can imagine that rigid red blood cells and deformed red blood cells moving through those tiny, small vessels might plug them up and make things worse. When these red cells are donated, they're put in a plastic bag. It's not good news for a red cell to be put in a blood bank. The side effects that occur with patients, the adverse events, are more common if your blood is more than, say, 14 days old. In the 80s, it was infectious disease. Now people are talking about the age of these products. As they sit on the shelf and become older and older and older, these products degrade. And the product that is in red blood cells that's 40 days old, as opposed to 14 days old, are very different products. And